work session. Mr. President, I would like to amend the agenda to add um, Dr. Maher to address regarding the elementary schedule. Okay. Do I have a second on that? Second. second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Dr. Maher. All right. Well, let me say that in the last 24 for sure, maybe 48 hours, there has been a, a whole lot of passion exhibited on the conversation that centers around the elementary schedule in general, but really our, our commitment to the fine arts specifically. And I wanna, I wanna share a little bit about um, where we are in that process. I also wanna share that as a school district, and while I don't speak for the board, I bet I do on this topic, we share that passion. And uh, I, know, I know personally I do as well. Spent thousands of dollars and a lot of time with lessons for my own kids and um, purchase of instruments, et cetera, et cetera. Beyond that, I, I currently sit as a board member in the South Dakota Symphony Orchestra. And I think if I did anything to hinder the passion for the arts in general and music specifically in our community, I would be excommunicated from that board. So that's just a little personal aside. Um, let me share why we are looking at the elementary schedule from a big picture perspective, and let me schedule where we are in that process. Let me talk about where we are in that process. The why stems back to our strategic plan. And one of the things that we talked about from a communication perspective in the strategic plan was uh, we do a lot of output when it comes to information and our question to ourselves was how do we get more information in and one of the things that we in implemented was focus groups um, some of those focus groups have been with teachers over the last three years and one of the issues that bubbles up with each elementary focus group that we have is our schedule is chaotic and very tough to deal with so I I challenged the Curriculum Services Department to look at this year, we've had a conversation for a couple of years, um, to look at the elementary schedule and see if we could build a better mousetrap. It wasn't about, it isn't about budget cuts, it isn't about fitting into this, uh, this small square when it comes to the budget. It's also not about cutting any particular area and what it is about is balancing everything that we have to put into that schedule uh, from a core curriculum perspective to a fine arts perspective and to everything else perspective. What, what makes sense in terms of balance in that elementary school schedule? So where are we in that process of development? We're smack dab in the middle of it. Um, I, I know uh, the, the group led by Dr. Boyson and the curriculum services side of our house has worked long and hard this year to try to figure out what might be, not what is, but what might be. And just last week, they began to take that information out and took a draft of what might be out to the first of three conversations that we're having with our teachers. Um, we received feedback at that meeting, much like you have seen through the emails you've received and, and that I have seen through the emails I've received, and that will inform our actions as we move forward. So we're not, we're not at an end point yet. So it asked for the gift of time before we, before we jump to any conclusions of how, how this looks. Um, two more, as I mentioned, only one of those information gathering sessions has taken place so far. Two more of those sessions are yet to take place. Again, I'll reiterate, this is not something that we're looking at due to budget cuts. This has nothing to do with the budget. In fact, what we're looking at is budget neutral. Uh, this is about putting together a schedule that makes sense for student outcomes, makes sense for our workforce. The, the teachers who deliver the curriculum on a daily basis, 
and of course something that that makes sense for our whole community uh, as well um, in the in the area specifically of music and i know this isn't only about music in terms of what we've received information on uh, but the majority of of uh, feedback i've received is in that particular area um, i would tell you that right now we are ahead and way ahead of the minutes offered of at least everybody who is contiguous to us and i don't know about how far out this extends in terms of minutes offered for music instruction on a weekly basis. And I don't say that as a reason to cut those minutes, but I say that as something that we're proud of and something that we want to see continue. So we will, we will work with that in mind. And for those of you who have reached out to us by email or are thinking to reach out to us by email, I want you to know that at least from the central office perspective, I know Dr. Nold Dr. Boyson and myself have received, <coughs> excuse me, many emails. It is our goal to respond to each of you, hopefully today, but there's been a lot of you. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll do the best that we can to, to reach back out. And, and again, I'm not asking you to, to buy anything. I'm not selling anything, but I am asking you for the gift of time while we figure out what that schedule is going to look like. Those are my concluding Sorry. words. Thank you, Dr. Maher. We do have, um, since that did become a budget item with the change, um, we will take public input. And Amy Scott Stoltz has signed up. Uh, you've got five minutes. If you will step to the microphone up at the. Up here? Yeah, yep. thank you. And give nice. us your name and address, please. Thank you. All right, my name is Amy Scott Stoltz. I'm a parent and a student here in the district. And um, I was contacted by a teacher who attended one of these meetings and then followed by the landslide of other teachers, other parents who were very concerned about the idea of cutting the specials. Not only the music, but also the art and the PE. So it's a, a rounded approach. Um, the teachers themselves have fabulous ideas on how to increase reading scores in the music classes, in the art classes. I want you to take the time, I urge you to take the time to listen to those teachers. They have a wealth of knowledge that has not been tapped into, I don't think, here. And they feel as this is a done deal. That is what they feel. So please communicate with them on what is actually going on if it's not a done deal yet. They want the specials in there. They know the importance of it. They're, if they haven't yet, they're going to inundate you with research on that. So they, they feel very passionately about this. As a parent of a student, I can't imagine cutting that time. I just, especially at the elementary level, especially in winters like we have, where they don't get outside for recess. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine the specials time being cut as well. That would academically harm many children. And I hope you take the time to really focus on what's best for the kids. I know you say it's budget neutral. I know that there's other issues involved that, that we are not aware of. This has been pretty quickly thrown at us all. And please take the time, do what you've done in the past, which has been fantastic communication with the public, and really listen to what parents have to say, what teachers have to say um, on this subject, because you'll find the passion is there for our specials. Music, PE, art, all of them are very important, and I hope you continue your tradition of listening to the public and listening to the teachers. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, we will move on now to the uh, budget. Um, we do have another person signed up, but that will be yep, on the budget. So we'll. Uh, oh.
Thank you. Everybody's got a budget book, and I'm just going to be going through these pages, and I think Deanne's going to be trying to show what we're looking at up on the screen, so if somebody doesn't have the book, they can follow along. Uh, I'd like to direct your attention, I guess, to, and then the, the middle of every page is a green page number. Sometimes there's other page numbers because these are different spreadsheets pulled together. So the green page number is the one I'm referring to. So if we just look at page one, um, as much as I like to think that everybody looks at our five-year plan and it makes all perfect sense to them, I found out recently that isn't the case. And uh, so what we tried to do, do is get a, a real simplistic view in one year of, of what's going on in that five-year plan. And you all know this because you hear we talk about it every year that we have an efficiency factor and we expect to find efficiency. That's the way our five-year plan balances. And so some people think, why are, we, why are we talking about budget cuts when, you know, we, we didn't go back in state aid. We had a net 1.8% increase is what I'd call it. But uh, because of the 0.7, which was one time last year. So this is a real simplistic look at one year, this year, that we're budgeting for right now of what's going on. So our revenue is about $163.5 million. We have a $9.1 million opt-out. We're actually proposing a transfer of capital outlay of $3 million which is 2.75 less than last year, I think. Um, so the total is $175.6 million. Our expense target was 176.3. That would eat into our fund balance by $700,000. And that would take our fund balance down to about $11 million. The expenses as submitted and recommended by our committees was 177.8. So it was 1.5 over that target. And that's why we talked about when we changed the, the uh, budget guidelines and timelines this year, we added some things that uh, the uh, exec team would look at uh, possible some, some bigger cuts that might not come out of the committees because we were a little leery of anybody uh, coming up with 1.5 and we knew we needed to meet that number. That was built into the budget last year. So, and we'll go through what, what many of those reductions are, but that, that was one thing we kind of anticipated, I guess, uh, back in November. So that's the what, and that's kind of where I usually stop talking, but I've been told, since I'm surrounded by educators, that that isn't always good enough. So the why on that is, this is just very simplistic, but it kind of spelled, our state aid, incre state aid increase, our net, because it was two and a half, but we got 0.7 one-time money on a per student basis last year, so it was built in. So our net increase was 1.8%. Our salary increase that we're proposing is 2.75. And if you look at the difference between 1.8 and 2.75 on our general fund salaries, that's $917,000. Our benefit increases, um, Social Security and retirement, they go up with the salary, so that's 2.75. Our health and dental are at about 4.6. Dental's a little less than that, but health thrives most of that. The shortfall there is 518,000. It comes to about, it comes to one, almost 1.5 million, 1 million That's simplistic. There's a lot more things going on in there, but that's a real basic look at why you have to, if we're not, if we're gonna try to keep our salaries moving forward and we're not gonna get state aid increases commensurate with, with the, kind of the minimum of what we wanna do, um, we're going to have to find efficiencies within the budget. So that's the general fund ver version. Next page on page. Oh, yeah. Um, the opt out, you mentioned we have 9.1 million that we have to uh, opt out. Yeah. Uh, We're currently authorized for 12.5 million. For now, and then we'll I'll show you in the plan where the seven and a half million is going to come off. Tw calendar year 2022. Okay. Uh, one of the things I'd like to suggest, I guess, is in the past we have pulled together the finance action network to look at where we're at uh, budget overall opt out in particular, and wondering if this might not be the year to turn it in together um, thank you D to bring that finance action network together again um, budgets tighter we're we're uh, having to look at more things that uh, we we're gonna 
struggle to keep up with and maybe now is the right time to get that outside set of eyes uh, back to look at what we are recommending to see if if they think we're on track so yeah, I'm good with that. No opposition no, to no. doing that. So none from the central office either. I think it's a great idea. I think timing's perfect for that. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, the next page is just kind of the same thing, but for special education. They too, uh, we had to look at some efficiencies in there. Um, revenue at 44, 45.4. Expense target was 46 for a fund balance change of. 600,000, uh, their fund balance is at a million, that's fairly low for them. Um, it's a little over, it's about 3%. Look, um, expenses as submitted were 47.8, so we're looking at 1.8 million, roughly, over the next year or two, getting out of there. Um, their state, again, their state aid increase was the same, 1.8, and they didn't get the one-time money. So they had a one point, I, I did it the same, but they actually uh, should be, it should have been one point. State aid increase for FY20 was actually 1% for them. And they didn't get those, the 1.7. So, so the salary increase then is 2.75. The shortfall is 260,000. Um, benefits increases again. And so their benefits shortfall and salary and benefits shortfall in one year it was 422,840. And it was even more than that because they didn't get the 1.8. Right, they, they didn't get the one, they got the one, they did, not, they did not get the extra 0.7, so they were already behind. So I just was using the same math. Um, and that's noted down below. And then one other thing that last year, you remember after the budget, we, we increased the EA salaries because we were having a very hard time hiring, starting, starting EAs because uh, you know the other salaries are at McDonald's and other places that were uh, approaching ours or maybe even exceeding ours. So if you look at the budget from two years ago and, and come up to this year, the, the salaries now have increased by a million dollars and that there was no state aid or to, to do that. So that, that's another heavy factor in this, of course. Todd, yeah. going back to page one, I just, I, it might be helpful just to talk again high level opt out versus our bond oh yeah so we'll we'll in a little bit we'll see what's happened with, to our property taxes and what is going to happen next year but last year we passed a bond to build facilities and the, the, the facilities were the, the biggest three are the, the three high school middle school and elementary school that is for that isn't for the teachers inside that isn't for the principals, it wasn't for the custodians or the, the, the heat and the fuel. That was, to, that was to build the buildings. And the reason we did that is what happened to the capital outlay restrictions a few years ago where we weren't able to access the $3 anymore. That's why we made the $3 promise. And at the time we did that, our capital outlay levy was 287. We said, we're gonna go back up to three between the two and no more than that. And, and that's where that 13 cents came from. As far as the opt-out goes, that, that is to fund the things I just said the bond was not to fund, teacher salaries, heat and lights, and, and all the operating costs of a school district. And that, we're at now $9.1 million in our opt-outs. We've had an opt-out since calendar year 2003. It was passed in 2002. We've had a version of that opt-out. And we have a little history going back to, to 2012 in here as well. We'll look at that. Um, the one doesn't have much to do with the other other than when you build a building you have more heat and lights but as far as like the teachers and the, the biggest expenses we have whether they're jammed into a building with 2500 kids as long as we're we're, we're staffing at 25 to 1 we're going to hire as many teachers no matter where they're at thank you yeah so i'm going to jump ahead uh, to the executive summary which kind of spells out the major changes that's on page 10 overall our revenue is going to be increased by 3.7 million our budget is going to be 175.4 million in revenue our expense budget is going to be 176.2 or that's what we're proposing that's a three and a half million dollar change um, it's going to be about it's about it's 
actually rounded up, but $0.8 million of uh, spending into the fund balance. Um, as we talked about, I don't, um, we're really driven by the state aid. We talk about this often, and I think we did it at the last regular board meeting. We were talking about let the legislature. Over eight, almost 90% of our general fund dollars revenue comes from the state aid formula, whether that's property taxes or state aid combination of that is almost 90% and about 85% of our expenditures are salaries and benefits so that one the revenue side has to drive the expenditure side eventually you can't you can't beat beat the physics on it you can't beat the economics on it for a long time so that is what drives our plan um, we uh, are going to spend into the fund balance by 764,000 it's lower than projected but that's because we got a $3 million transfer from the capital outlay fund budgeted for next year that we didn't anticipate last year. And it's because of the timing on our bond payments. We didn't have to, the first payment was particularly low, so we didn't, we were ramping up to what we're gonna, so the bond didn't cost as much as it would have if, if you bought a house and you had a payment in the next month. It, it's, we're ramping up to that. So that's what's going on there. Um, the lowest projected fund balance over the five year period is 5% with a 7% projected fund balance in FY24. Last year we had planned the lowest projected fund balance to be 5.5. When we get in this plan, I'll tell you a number to look at it. It's gonna be about, the number is gonna be about $10 million is where our fund balance needs to be to cash flow the district. It's about $10 million. Um, $10 million equates to close to 25 million in actual cash at the end of June. And then we, we spend down about $20 million going from June, end of June to the end of October when we get our first big tax payment. So 10, you know, 10 million gives you a fairly safe cushion, but not much of one for cash, cash flow, not for major cuts or anything like that. So we'll talk about that too as we go. So just the revenue highlights, $600,000 is New state aid formula funds due to increased enrollment and increased ELL enrollment. 3.4 million in additional state aid formula funds due to a 2.5% increase in the ongoing per student allocation. And in the formula itself, that is 2.5, so that's the state aid part of that. Um, 1 million in increased state aid due to the reallocation of other fund revenues. Last year, because of the hold harmless, we lost about a million dollars in the form. We're just getting that back. And in the next two years, we project <coughs> to go positive on that. Um, $200,000 in school and public land funds, additional. 600000 in additional interest. Interest rates are up a little bit. It doesn't help our bond payments, but it helps uh, revenue when we have money. And uh, transfer $3 million from the capital outlay fund. We talked about yeah. that. Expenditures, what's uh, changing there? $2.7 million increase. In salaries, 260,000 in K through 12 teacher salaries for additional students, 1.2 million increase in health insurance and other benefit increases, 670,000 transfer of expenses from the SPED fund to the general fund. We'll go through that in a little more detail. 230,000 in miscellaneous increases and uh, several general fund <coughs> reductions to stay with it. And that's that trying to get that efficiency factor, which is what we went through in the big budget committee. And so some of those on a high level, 250,000 in reduced contract costs. I think well, you're gonna get a report on that. I think it's next Monday. Um, but uh, we, we believe we'll be able to save 250,000 on a particularly large contract we have. 185,000 in FTE, it has to do with <coughs> extra FTE in the, in, the, in the high school budget that is not associated with the 25 to one. It's over and above that and just getting rid of some hold harmlesses and things like that. So that's 185,000. $30,000 stipend for tech integration specialists. Many years ago, we was at a $500 stipend. We added into a teacher to take the leadership on, on tech ed we think we come a long way since then and we don't need to have a, a leader that, that we compensate for. Um, $39,000 for taking the AP coordinator planning periods from two to one a day. So they have one planning period for AP. Um, 
thousand dollars out of the middle school for tech ed EAs. Now that is a there's a curriculum change there, and the, the old curriculum was very heavy into power tools, and, they, and it's much less reliant on them now. And that was a, a safety issue for that prior curriculum, and they don't feel that it they're not using them nearly as much anymore. So you don't need an extra set of hands in there with the kids. Um, 840,000 for the RISE general ed double count. Everybody knows about our RISE program. Um, those are our most severely affected special ed students. Not every school has a RISE classrooms in it. Um, so the SBA does, uh, Laura Wilder doesn't for instance. And when we would assign general fund, this isn't about special ed at all, but when we would assign general fund teachers to schools with RISE students in it, we'd count them in there. So, it's, and those kids aren't in the general ed classroom, or if they are, it's very, very little, and if they are, they have an EA, an aide with them. So, our thoughts were, this was a kind of a nice to have, but when you're looking at efficiency cuts, we're really, Art of, by counting those RISE students, we're artificially lowering the class size in those schools than in schools that don't have them. So we said we're not gonna, we're, we don't count a student, we assign to, I'm gonna say children's care, but they're. Lifescape. Lifescape. We don't assign that student to a school and then put a teacher in there for every 25 of those. And RISE kids have special ed teachers in the RISE classrooms, so we're not gonna fund we're proposing not funding the general fund classroom for those students as well. Does that make sense? If there's 25 RISE students at, at SBA, they'll have one less classroom teacher because those, they have actually two or two and a half classroom teachers in the RISE classroom. So that's what's going on there. So it's and, more of a recalculation than a yeah, it was something change that was, in staffing per se. Yeah, well, it'll, it'll impact staffing. There would there would there would be less staffing, but the but the reason they get the increased staffing right now is because of a double count. Okay. What we're saying is we're going to count all students in those buildings like we count students in other buildings. Okay. It's one of those things. If you said why why we do it that way, I'd say it's because it's, we've done it that way ever since I've been here. We've always done it that way, and it's just one thing that you got to look at when you're trying to make cuts that don't hurt as much as other cuts would, that that's something that maybe we should correct. Sure, okay. Um, what, what, I want to be clear, that's not a, it's not a reduction in services to RISE students at all. There's, there's no reduction in services mm -hmm. to RISE students. Yeah, it's just getting rid of the artificially lowered class, artificially lowered class sizes in the, on the general fund side. Um, special ed, some of the big ones there. There's a million dollars in early intervening services or comprehensive early intervening services. Now, what that is, on a big picture, what that is about, and it goes back several years to IDEA, allowed up to 15% of the IDEA funds to be used for kids that didn't, weren't on an IEP. They weren't special ed students yet. They weren't identified for special ed, but the idea was if we got some, some services that to intervene, maybe they wouldn't become special ed. They wouldn't eventually, they wouldn't get an IEP, is, was the idea of that. And so now when you're looking at making cuts in the special education budget, you've got to serve the kids on an IEP. I mean, that's the law. You've got to do that. You don't have to serve kids in a, in a hopes of event that they won't get an IEP. Now, does it save money? Maybe it, you know, maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't, but you've got to serve those kids on the IEP side. So what we first looked at cutting in special ed is the early intervening services. And then additional federal, state and local allow it now too. The state allows it with state and local funds. So that's about, that, that's a pretty good sum of money that's in there. And so what those cuts really involve, at the elementary level, there uh, is a reading program and, and we plan to, to cut that, I believe it was Read 180 they tried to implement in there that which was very successful in middle school, not so much in elementary. Might have changed since, but the idea here is is to replace it with SIPS. We're gonna pump, you know, SIPS is a new program, it's been fairly successful. We want to expand it, and we're gonna use Title I dollars, is it Title I? Federal dollars to 
to put those in. So essentially there is going to be a reading intervention. Um, it's just going to be federal title dollars instead of CEIS money. Um, not, not even essentially. There is going to be. Oh, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Literally. How's that? Yes, yes. Right. yes. Um, and, that, and that's who have been piloting that. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Right, yep. Seeing yeah. real and we're going to expand results. it yeah. for next year with federal dollars, not special ed dollars. Middle school, they use, they have a reading intervention, read 180. Um, it's a 90 minute period. We're going to take it back to the regular class size of 50. And uh, to be honest, principals, not all, the principals in the past have asked about getting that down to 50 minutes so it matches up to their regular schedule and that those kids don't miss social studies or PE or, or so. So it's kind of nice that it, it'll fit in with this, that uh, we, can, uh, we can still offer the program and still serve the same number of kids. Now the question is, will they, will they get executed from the program as fast? We don't know, we'll have to find out what the effect of that is. But that's the, the, the half cut at the middle school level. And at the high school, and I should have asked because I'm, remember. At the high school, we're cutting the FTE for the program. What's it called, Dan? Islet. Islet is the program they use. We'll still have that, but we're cutting the FTE, so they're gonna have to take it out of their regular 25 to one high school FTE allocation instead of having special allocation for these kids in this reading intervention. So that's, that's, what's, that's what's going on at the high school level. Um, the other, I guess, major thing to look at in special ed, maybe two. One is a behavior team. We're moving, there's five behavior teams, or is it four? Four or five behavior teams that serve the elementary schools. Um, one of those was funded with CEIS dollars, the, and so they were a general fund team. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to serve any kids that weren't on an IEP. So that is getting moved out and getting moved in into the into the general fund. We feel we need that behavior team. So that's moving over there. Um, the other one is that tier two goes into ELL or EL middle, elementary, middle school, high school FTE count. Um, what that really is, it's kind of complex, but set a few years ago, we really started to expand our, our tier two classrooms, which are behavior classrooms. And uh, half of it, is for special ed students, half for general fund. Well, when we did that, we did not count that against the, the um, resource allocation into the school. And, it, and some of these, some of the, it turns out, some of these tier two teachers do have a, a caseload, they, they manage the IEP, and it's roughly, a full-time teacher manages roughly 20 IEPs. So some of them have been managing them, others haven't. The idea here is we're gonna put them into the formula now. So it, will it won't reduce the tier two teacher program, but it'll reduce the, resor the other resource teachers and they will man every one of them will be expected to manage 10, 10 IEPs if they're half time special ed. So it's really, it's kinda of like the rise cut was really affected the general fund. This tier two cut does not affect tier two programming. It affects the, it's kind of a double count in the the, um, I say moderate, that's not, I just said it a minute ago, the uh, resource allocation. That's what's at actually getting reduced there. So those are the major reductions. I'm kind of running out of time, so I'm gonna try to, any questions on that? And I'll just steer you to page uh, 13. That's our five-year plan, and Kent, your question about the, the opt-out, Yep. That's why on line six up top there, that's why those three areas, so we have three years of the five-year plan that are boxed there, and it's because that assumes we maintain the ability to opt out that we have right now, but that opt out, that seven and a half million dollar opt out does expire in 2020, calendar year 2022. Okay. So that's why that's boxed there. And you can see the plan what it ends up with out in the future, we're at 7%, that's not ideal, but it is enough to cash flow. You can see we get, we drop under 10 million once there. Still think we can probably cash flow if the exact same case is in the future as it is today, but, but it's really getting low. You don't want to be below 10 million, but honestly, very much. Um, 
the key variables we look at down below the, the line, I guess it looks green, it's yellow on my computer, but um, we know we're gonna gain some money in the equalized other, we have $5.9 million of equalized other revenue there. We know when it gets fully equalized, we believe our share of it will be about two million more, and that's what that's just building that in. Um, state apportionment, of course, we adjust that every year based on what we receive. The opt-out, it assumes the same opt-out next year as this year, and then a slight growth in 2022, 2023, 2024, just a, a real slight one, kind of to keep up with inflation, and Doug came up with a cool spreadsheet I'll show you in a second that talks about that. Our efficiency factor, it was tough getting those efficiencies this year. Next year we call for a fairly big one too, 1%. If we don't do that, we have to, the only way, other way to balance the budget is, is uh, salaries. So it's uh, it's very, it's, it's something in there that we have to keep in mind. Our teacher delta, that's in line with projections. Um, Todd Tolke had brought up is our state aid increase because I always had it at three. I lowered it to two and a half to be more realistic in there. And our, our salaries are tied to state aid, but we try to beat them by 0.75% so that the delta doesn't eat up the entire increase. So we keep our salaries going forward. That makes sense. So that's what's going on on this page. The next page is just a different view of the same sheet. And it kind of shows you where our budget would be without, if you look at the very bottom, when uh, Doug was on the board, he had us put this in. If we didn't have to get those efficiency factors, look what our fund balance would do. It's, it's extremely low. So like I said, these numbers make a lot of sense to me and those of us that look at these pretty closely. I know to the general public, it's like, well, that's why we came out with that one, that real simple sheet that shows what's going on in one year. But all this stuff affects each year going out. So if you go to page 15, that's that opt-out summary. Going back to 2012, or $7.5 million opt-out. It'll go off in 2021. We opted out in 2018 for $5 million, and that was for two things, really. It was for fear of federal funds reducing, and they are down a bit since then, but also fear of we put in these new teacher salary increases, and if we get one, one and a half, 2% or less from the state, what's gonna happen to them? Um, so that was like, that was in there as a, so we could keep our salaries moving forward. We accessed it right away that first year, but we really have, we increased it at like $60,000 since that first year. So that is a tool that is out there for the board. And then that was, yeah, that gets, gets to your point. And we'll look at that with our, our uh, finance action network, the business community. Um, <coughs> He had, a, he had a line over there that, uh, that what would be going on if, we, if, it, if it had inflated from that seven and a half million. And you can see that amount there. Um, and then our total budget, you can see the percent of the opt-out is a percent of the total budget. In 2012, it was 5.7. Next year, it's projected to be 5.1. So it's actually, you're eating away at it by not increasing it as inflation goes up for everything else. That's kind of the message showing over there. That makes sense. And then, of course, yeah, the excess shortfall, what we're not using, and then if the 7.5 goes away, then we'll be in the negative on that number, not on the positive. Our levies, this gets back to uh, kind of Kate's question. We said we were going to increase our levy in 2019 by 13 cents. We actually didn't. We actually held it flat. But the 13 cent increase will come next year. And that's exactly what we said when we opted out. We just were able to delay it for a year. And uh, that's found uh, you know, on the payable 2020 taxes. On a house that whose owners shall remain nameless in Southwest Sioux Falls, since uh, the year 2000, the total School taxes increased 31.5% in 20 years. That's an uh, average annual increase of 1.5. And you, you all know, and we've talked about this one on our bond issue, that of our neighbor, of all of our neighbors, we are the lowest. We were the lowest, we still are. 
And if you added 13 cents to ours this year, it'd still be the lowest of all of, of, all of our neighbors. Um, time is flying. So any questions on any, that's a lot of info. And you know, you've got the detail of, of that follows this, of kind of a roll up detail and then uh, by, by cost center, the main change that's happened in the cost center starting on page 23. I encourage you to look through that. Um, I do want to talk about the capital outlay fund. And if there isn't any questions on the general fund, it's better to kind of get in all in one big deal. Capital outlay, that, go to page 35, please. So remember, in the capital outlay fund, we're balancing the levy now with uh, the bond fund. And so that's why if you look up top, our, our tax revenue actually drops, even though we show valuation increases of, we're um, cautiously projecting them at three and a half percent after this year, per year. That would, on average, I mean, we average more than that usually in the district, it's more like four and a half. And that's dropping because we're lowering the levy because the bond levy is going up, is, is what's happening there. Just wanted to point that out to you. Um, We've got the technology plan fully funded. That's a good thing. And we are still able to, remember, uh, Jeff, I didn't look this up. When's our last drawdown of the bond? Is it 2024? So we'll be out of bond funds then, and presumably there'll be some more construction projects needed in, in the school district. So we are saving a little bit of money in a CIP projects fund. If you go to the next page, it shows the cash flow on that fund. We don't plan to spend any money out of it while we spend down the bond proceeds. But in uh, 2024, if we spend nothing, we'd have $11 million for capital projects. And an elementary school will cost more than that. But then we do have money in the, I'm just trying to give you, we have money in the bond fund for the elementary school, but I'm just trying to give you some perspective on that. So that's, uh, you know, I, that's real high level. Any, Questions on that? Questions on the budget for Todd Veek. Okay, we, we've got a person who is wishing to address the board on the budget, Tony Martinet. If you would give us your name and your address, please, and you've got five minutes. Tony Martinet, 46220 West Shore Place. Uh, I am also uh, president for the Sioux Falls Education Association. Um, as a teacher, I never taught the same lesson twice. There were always changes that could be made to improve my lessons and the experience for my students. And sometimes those, cha those changes were drastic. Within a single day, I might completely revamp my entire lesson from period one to period three because it was needed to improve the educational quality of my teaching. I and most teachers understand and believe that change is needed and is good for education. As the association president, I ask them um, when I have educators contact me with their concerns or reactions to any proposed change, I ask them to reflect and identify the source of their reactions. Are you reacting because there is simply something different and unknown, or are you reacting because there's a legitimate concern about the quality of education caused by this change? If it is the former, then I encourage them to take a breath, walk away, and come back to talk when they can be open to the new possibilities that change can bring. If their reaction is founded on the latter concern about the quality of education, then we take the time to analyze and pinpoint what about the changes causing the concern for quality. I come to you today to seek more information to help me and other educators be able to identify if our reactions really are because there is simply a change with this budget or if there's a possible impact to the overall quality of education. Being able to identify any impact to the quality of education is not always easy because some of the changes will not be known until actual implementation. Um, or at least until the details are developed. We don't have that, and we possibly can't until the budget is actually approved. Unfortunately, most of the major changes to the budget were shared with teachers uh, to teachers about two weeks ago, and the budget goes for approval in five days. There has only been limited time to dig into what changes exist in this budget, so the time to ask questions is now to ensure that answers can be found. Currently, there's just two specific areas of concern. 
The first is tier two behavior reclassification. With the new budget, the dedicated tier two behavior teachers in our title buildings are now being included as part of the building SPED FTE. This requires that all tier two teachers now pick up some of the SPED caseload paperwork at the least, and in some buildings, the tier two teachers may be needed to start being more involved in providing special ed services to students. This can decrease the availability of the tier two teachers to offer immediate support and interventions for behaviors in our buildings. It also means that we may have to replace some of our tier two teachers because they need to have their SPED endorsement to help. Will this put extra stress on the staff in those buildings? Can this possibly lead to increased behavior escalations, which would interfere with the learning environment of our students? Is there another way a school has planned to absorb this cut and still offer effective services? Our other area of concern is time to plan adjustments. With many of the changes being proposed in the budget, adding new programs, changing personnel, uh, reducing instructor support for some programs, or modifications to curriculum, there's a lot that needs to be figured out. There's just under two months left of the school year to accomplish the planning with teachers for these changes, or else the district will have to pay teachers for the time in the summer to get the work done, or there'll be a lot of rushing at the beginning of next year. What is the coordinated plan for addressing these needs? As they say, the devil is in the details, and it may be that these questions have answers, and we just need to time to share them and to find them, and the educators are willing and ready to do that work. we just like to be able to help. Thank you. Yeah. When did we start this process? November. How many committees? 19, I think. Do we have teachers on those committees? Yeah, yeah all, virtually everyone. Thank you. Okay. And the, <clears throat> the approval on Monday night is approval of the tentative budget. The, the final budget is not approved until July. Right, so I mean, what we're what we're looking at is recommendation uh, and approval of tentative budget. So, uh, yeah, of course, that means to me that there will certainly be appropriate amount of time to look at the approval. It also gives the finance action network time to do their work and come back for uh, conversation that uh, can then be approved uh, final approval at the second meeting in July. So, any, any other questions, discussion um, on the budget presentation? And as always, I believe uh, business manager Veek is available to answer questions between now and the meeting on Monday and any time we might have questions that, uh, that we didn't ask today. So. We will move on then to the legislative report. I was just going to say that nothing's changed from when I presented the other, you know, to you, the board meeting at the last, the last meeting. There was no, you know, they had one more day of meetings and not, nothing changed. The same bills passed, so I don't really have a lot to add there. I don't see it's got a couple of things. Okay. Dr. Ask, Dr. Maher asked me to kind of run through the bills that had passed to kind of give you a general idea of what me, what we might be looking at for potential changes um, prior to our next school year. And I wanted to point out three different changes to you just to kind of give you a heads up. The first two are specifically related to board meetings um, that will require change in our policy. One will be that we need to add the addition of an executive session topic um, of the um, safety issues for schools. So that will be, uh, we will need to add that to policy BB on school board meetings. And so we have those executive sessions listed. And that was based on the House Bill 1048. The other House, the, the Senate Bill 91, an act to revise certain provisions regarding open meeting requirements, will also cause us to need to review both policy BE on school board meetings and policy BEDH on public participation at school board meetings. As I look at the changes to 
the state law, we're going to need to clarify when we need to post an agenda versus when we need to post a notice of quorum. So it used to be that we might have to post a, a that an official meeting might include when you all might be present at another public entity meeting. Um, so on some or other non-regular meetings. So on some of those things now, we'll just have to post a notice of quorum. And looking at the impact of what the law is going to require on public input at regular meetings, what that change in regular meetings is, and whether or not we want to change our public participation um, in our policy, policy based on those state law changes. So that was Senate Bill 91. <coughs> and again, um, policy BEDH and B. The final one that I wanted to bring to your attention, and just so you know, um, through the spring and summer, we do a bigger review. So there might be other changes in policy needed, but just wanted to bring these to your attention. <coughs> On Senate Bill 55, an act to require the national motto of the United States to be displayed in public schools, um, we will need to, beginning in the 1920 school year, have the national motto, In God We Trust, displayed in each of our public schools. It has to be located in a prominent location and it um, has to be on a mounted plaque, artwork, or other appropriate form, and um, has to be 12 inches, the display has to be 12 inches wide by 12 inches high. So as an executive leadership team, we're looking um, at how can we best do this in the Sioux Falls School District, and um, to make sure that that has a civic, patriotic, purpose as um, hopefully that was the intent of the legislature and um, in doing so one question I had for the board would be whether or not you would like to include that requirement I mean you have to follow the state law but we could also include the requirement in our patriotic activities policy or we could just instead issue guidance to principals on this new requirement From an administrative standpoint, we've had uh, a lot of dialogue on this, and it's our intent to meet, in fact and in deed, the, the law. So we not only will meet the letter of the law, we'll meet the intent of the law as well. We want to do it in a way that's educational. We want to do it in a way that's responsive um, to what the legislature has, has uh, required of us, and we'll bring you some, uh, we'll bring you an example for your consideration down the road. But uh, as legal counsel has said, the question before you today um, is do we, do we make a policy in regards to this or do we just provide guidance to our, our uh, building level leaders on how to, how to implement this? I'm, I'm good either way. Are you asking for us to think about this? Yes. Thank you. Um, that'll be great. We will do that and then take action. So that's a nice font size. Nothing like this. Is there any other law that we are currently have under that do we have guidance or do we have policy on in our hmm. school district? Um, yeah, I mean, the chapter 13 is very, you know, so we've kind of summarized which ones we need to give more guidance on than what's stated in the law or that we need to reiterate. Um, for example, when I'm thinking about our patriotic activities policy, we have information on the Pledge of Allegiance. That was its original intent. Last year, when the legislature added the requirement that Boy Scouts or other patriotic groups have the right to come to school, we added that to that patriotic activities policy, so I thought that if we add it to policy, that would be where we want to go. But the Pledge of Allegiance isn't a state law. No. 
maybe this is a dumb question, but what beyond hanging said plaque on the wall are we required or are we intending to do? Because if that's the end of it, then I'm wondering why we would need to put right. it in a policy when it's kind of a, yeah. for lack of a better term, one and done. We hung it up. We wanted to, uh, you've heard this from me before, I wanted to be the hired help on that and let you decide, sure. is, this, is this policy or, or okay. not? I'm, I'm, I'm neutral and I don't even have any guidance for you as to which okay. way that should go. But in terms, maybe just as a, as a foreshadowing, I would tell you that our, our goal isn't to just meet the intent and put up in God we trust. Our goal is to make, uh, make this a civics lesson as well for anybody who wants to see it. So we wanna, we wanna meet the letter of the law and the intent of the law then we want, to, we want to even go beyond um, what the law requires of us to to uh, to do. And as I said, we'll bring that to you okay. down the road. Yeah. One reason to put it in policy would be if the board wanted to add specific requirements, either in addition to or kind of to help explain how the Sioux Falls School District is going to apply this law. So for example, if you really liked the mounted plaque idea that that's not required by the law, so you'd want to require that by policy. Okay. Any other questions on uh, the legislator, legislature's treatment of the public schools? All right. Um, we will move on. We are a little short on time, so for committee reports, um, I'll open it up if somebody has something uh, pressing that they want to report to the board on, we will certainly take that now. Otherwise, we'll... Just a couple of dates that are coming up. Yep. The teacher retiree recognition <coughs> banquet, April 17th, and the uh, April 29th is Sioux Falls Education Foundation fundraiser at Carroll House. So I just wanted to put those in mind on the calendar. Okay, great. I think we'll have a couple of policies that are just uh, yeah, review revised minor changes for Monday, so nothing major. On the budget committee, I just want to say this is my first time on there, and it's amazing how much work goes into it and how impressive it is that that's laid out the way it, it is for us to see. And Mr. Reed teases that it's complicated, but I can't imagine what you do to make it so that we can read it. So everybody that's involved with that, that's, I appreciate that. Thank you. Anything else to come before the board at this time? Then we are adjourned. Thank you.